On the ninth of November, 1862, Monitor steamed back into Hampton Roads for the final time after it had exited a refit in the Washington Navy Yard. The much-needed refit would see the machinery go through repairs, a funnel would be added over top of the boiler exhaust to guarantee that water would not enter this location, and two stacks were added over top the ventilators for the engine rooms to also guarantee that water would not enter that location. The remainder of November, and for the majority of December, Monitor would have a quiet time, which is always favorable during a war. On the 24th of December, 1862, Captains John Pine Bankhead aboard Monitor and Percival Drayton aboard the brand new Monitor Passaic would receive the orders that stated, Proceed in tow of the Rhode Island, with the Monitor under your command, to Beaufort, North Carolina, and wait for the orders. Avail yourself of the first favorable weather for making the passage, and in the case of the Passaic, it would be towed by the USS State of Georgia. Weather around Hampton Roads would be rough, and in the meantime, Passaic would travel to that location, arriving on the 26th of December. From there, the four vessels would wait for weather to break, which did not occur until the 29th. Between the 26th and the 29th, preparations were made aboard the two monitors to prepare them in the event that they did enter rough weather. Oakum was placed under the turrets, hatches, slits, and hawse pipes were caulked up, and the ships were effectively sealed off from any location that was known to leak in the weather that Monitor had entered on the 7th of March earlier that year. Before the turrets were placed on top of the Oakum, they were run out to starboard, so the hatches from the base of the turret to the top of the hull had lined up, and this meant that the only entrance and exit to the ship was through the turret hatches. At 2.30 p.m. on the 29th of December, with preparations having been complete and the weather having broke, the ships cast off and headed south towards North Carolina. Per standard United States Navy sailing procedures at the time, a couple miles distance was to be kept between the ships, so Rhode Island and Monitor would be about two or three miles closer inland than Passaic and state of Georgia. The positions of the ships would play a crucial role in the upcoming events, as... Monitor was attempting to slip past the Diamond Shoals inside of the Gulf Stream, which was flowing north at roughly three knots, while Passaic and State of Georgia would enter the Gulf Stream, slowing their progress, but the deeper water was considered safer. As the ships entered the Cape Hatteras area, the calm weather that they had experienced since the beginning of the voyage would begin to deteriorate as a warm and cold current struck one another in this location, and there was a low-pressure front entering the area. A perfect storm was beginning to brew. During the early hours of the 30th of December, Rhode Island clocked in the winds at Force 2, which was about 4 to 6 knots. A few miles further offshore, the Passaic clocked in the winds at Force 4, which was anywhere from 11 to 16 knots. Monitor became a little difficult to navigate in the 5-knot winds, However, the ship remained watertight, and the crew's morale remained high. On the other hand, Passaic was almost impossible to steer, and the ship began piling into the waves rather than riding over them, and the waves began slamming on the turret, making it tremble. Conditions would deteriorate, and Passaic's logbook states, latter part of the noon to 4 p.m. watch, making quantity of water, one watch constantly bailing water, engineers and firemen employed in trying to settle the turret, but are as yet unsuccessful. As designed, the immense weight of the turret was intended to create a watertight seal at its base using a brass ring. However, as the ship's hull flexed in heavy seas, the turrets would sway side to side, causing these 150-ton iron structures to slightly lift up, creating gaps at which water could freely enter the ships. Though Oakum was placed under the turrets to guarantee a watertight seal, as the turrets lifted up off the Oakum, it completely negated the effect of the Oakum. At 4.15 p.m., State of Georgia and Passaic paused their course so State of Georgia could bury one of its crew members at sea, who had died earlier that morning, and the two ships spotted Rhode Island and Monitor about six miles off the starboard bow, bearing west-southwest. At this time, the mood aboard Monitor remained high, and at 5 p.m., dinner was served like normal. The ship at this point still remained watertight. By 6.30, this mood would change. 
as Paymaster William Keeler would write, we were now off Cape Hatteras, the Cape Horn of our Atlantic coast. The wind was blowing violently, the heavy seas rolled over our bows, dashing against the pilot house, and surging aft would strike the solid turret with the force to make it tremble, sending off on either side a boiling, foaming torrent of water. The ship's surgeon, Greenville Weeks, wrote, The little vessel plunged through the rising waves instead of riding on them as they increased in violence, so that, even when we considered ourselves safe, the appearance was of a vessel sinking. At the same time, Passaic's log noted, From 6 to 8 p.m., the ship laboring in head sea, leaking badly forward in anchor well, hands bailing water from under the berth deck, beneath the turret, and passing it into the fire room, and from there pumped out. While Passaic had been flooding for approximately four hours by the time 7.30 approached, hell would finally begin to break loose aboard Monitor, as the port side hawser connecting it to Rhode Island had separated, and Monitor began yawing badly, and the waves began plowing into the turret, and finally, Monitor began to flood. At 8 p.m., Monitor's log stated, the sea commenced to rise very rapidly, causing the vessel to plunge heavily, completely submerging the pilot house, and washing over into the turret, and at times, into the blower pipes. The undersurface of the projecting armor would come down with great force, loosening still more the packing around the turret's base. At the same time, Passaic's logs recorded frequent squalls with rain, ship leaking badly, all hands employed at bailing water, as before, and throwing over shot threw overboard 340, 32-pound shot. At about 8.30, Monitor's engineer, Waters, reported that the bilge pumps were unable to keep up with the onrush of water, and he was ordered to start the high-capacity centrifugal pump. At about 8.40, with all of the pumps operating aboard Monitor, Waters reported that the water was still gaining in the engine room, having risen several inches above the engine room floor, and the coal was beginning to dampen, and water was splashing into the ash pits. The situation aboard Passaic at that moment was even worse, as its pumps had become clogged, and the ship stopped ejecting water. So, Captain Drayton had to make a decision. At 10 p.m., finding that I could not stand the thumping of the heavy southwest sea, I directed the state of Georgia to run north and get a lean north of Hatteras. By 10.30, State of Georgia and Passaic had made a 180-degree turn, and rather than plowing into the waves, they were now being carried north by them. The crew aboard Passaic began hand-bailing the water with buckets, and the ship would eventually enter calm seas. It had been saved by Captain Drayton's last-minute decision. While 10.30 proved to be the time that Passaic would save itself, it would simultaneously be the time that Monitor's fate was sealed, as it was reported to Captain Bankhead that the water was still rising in the engine room and it was approaching the fires of the boilers. Should the fires go out, the ship would lose steam pressure, and thus it would lose function to all of its machinery, including the bilge pumps. Even by this point, the machinery was operating at a lower capacity than it should have been because the coal was wet and too much steam was being diverted to too many machines at once. A few minutes after 10.30, Captain Bankhead conferred with his officers, and the men agreed that since the fires were about to be extinguished, there was no chance to save the Monitor. It was time to raise the Red Lantern and abandon ship. The Red Lantern was Monitor's distress signal, since the ship did not carry lifeboats of its own. Upon raising the Red Lantern, Rhode Island would have to send lifeboats to Monitor to collect Monitor's crew, and this would have to be done several times before Monitor could be fully evacuated. With the machinery dying, Monitor's crew began to use buckets to dump water outside of the ship, with them being passed up to the turret and dumped over the side. This was hopefully going to save the ship for a few extra minutes. While Rhode Island's crew prepared to launch the lifeboats, there was another situation that had to be addressed aboard Monitor, the remaining starboard hawser connecting it to Rhode Island. There were two issues with this hawser. It was making Monitor unmanageable, and, in the event Monitor sank, it could potentially drag Rhode Island down with it. Captain Bankhead called for volunteers to go forward and part the hawser, and three men jumped forward. Master Lewis Stodder, Boson's mate John Stalking, and quarter gunner James Fenwick. As the men were approaching the bow, a wave would crash over the Monitor, 
and only Stoddard would remain on board. The other two perished in the sea. Stoddard made it forward with an axe and parted the hawser successfully, and then he would return to the turret. With the little bit of engine power the Monitor had left, it would maneuver towards Rhode Island, so the launch and cutter that Rhode Island had launched would not have a long distance to travel. However, the situation became dangerous. Monitor and Rhode Island began to drift dangerously close, and they were under risk of colliding. And at this time, Rhode Island was launching a third launch, and it got caught between the two ships, resulting in it being badly damaged, though it ended up saving 16 of Monitor's crew members, the launch was recovered, and could not be used again. With the ships too close to one another, Rhode Island restarted its engines in order to gain some distance, and at this moment, the hawser that Stoddard had cut earlier had become entangled in one of the paddle wheels, and Rhode Island was out of control. By the time the paddle wheel was untangled, the two ships had drifted nearly two miles apart. The remaining launch began to approach Rhode Island at this time, and on board it was Surgeon Weeks. He had his right hand sticking out the side of the launch, and as it approached Rhode Island, the two vessels became too close, and they slid up against one another. Weeks' right hand was crushed between the two, resulting in him losing three of his fingers, and his right arm was dislocated. A few minutes after midnight, the Monitor's boilers were overcame by water, they lost steam pressure, and the ship's machinery fell silent for the last time. Captain Bankhead was heard to say, It is madness to remain here any longer. Let each man save himself. Of the three lifeboats that Rhode Island had launched to the Monitor for the first round, only the cutter would return for a second wave. By the time the cutter had returned to the Monitor, the water beneath the turret was reportedly waist-deep, and the ship was barely clinging to life. Even with that said, several men refused to leave the Monitor, as the cutter was overloaded and struggling in the waves, and they felt safer aboard the larger Monitor, while one man, Engineer Samuel Lewis, was reported to have been too seasick to leave his berth, and he remained within the Monitor. Captain Bankhead would abandon the ship at this time. The cutter would return to the Rhode Island to unboard the Monitor survivors, and while it did that, about half of its operators would also leave, as they too had had enough of the sea. After having his arm reset and three of his fingers amputated, Surgeon Weeks went to the side of Rhode Island and watched the Monitor's final moments. He stated, For an hour or more we watched from the deck of the Rhode Island the lonely light upon the Monitor's turret. A hundred times we thought it gone forever. A hundred times it reappeared, till at last it sank, and we saw it no more. The time was 1.30 a.m. on the 31st of December, 1862. Monitor had struggled in the waves while flooding for six hours. The cutter by that point was on its way back to the Monitor, and when the light had disappeared, it had turned around to return to the Rhode Island. However, Rhode Island had lost sight of the cutter, and it began steaming away. Rhode Island shot rockets and began to search with blue lights throughout the night and into the morning. However, it couldn't find the cutter. The following day, after Rhode Island had given up searching for the cutter, the schooner, A. Colby, had spotted the cutter and saved the crew aboard it, returning them to the Rhode Island. Rhode Island saved a total of 47 of Monitor's crew, 16 had perished over the course of the sinking. The United States Navy's first attempt to move two of its most modern and powerful warships deep into the south had proved an absolute failure. The Passaic had taken damage and had to return north where it would be repaired, while the Monitor ended up sinking. The Monitor would not be seen again until August of 1973, when its wreck was discovered resting 16 miles off Cape Hatteras, upside down, with its turret having been dislodged and located under the engine room. While it appeared in December of 1862 that Monitor had completed its final voyage, the ship still had one more voyage to make during its recovery. However, that is a story for another day. So, if you have learned something new in this video, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.